let's talk about player agency. This is something that was unfairly pigeonholed and then forgotten about. I'd like to pull it out of that pigeonhole, brush it off, and talk about it. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to redefine it. For the sake of this video, player agency is defined as the player's ability to express their relationship to the narrative. Sounds like a kind of wild definition, but hang with me here for a second. If we hearken back to the golden era of player agency discussions, when it came down to RPGs, nearly all of them were about branching narratives. You give the player a meaningful choice in the narrative. Are they good or are they evil? And then you repeat the process, and, you know, by the time the game is over, they've chosen how the narrative went, and it's custom to them, their own personal beliefs. This turned out to be an absolutely garbage way to do it. Not for any moral reasons, but just because it's extraordinarily expensive and doesn't accomplish very much. Just for starters, you need twice as much content every time you branch. Narrative content, anyway. So it gets expensive real quick. In addition, there's usually one best way to tell a story, so if you create branches, there are branches that are inherently going to be worse stories. And in addition, everybody always chooses good. So you're spending an enormous amount of money on stuff that the players won't ever see. Now obviously there have been a lot of games that have pressed this, have tried to work with this. Uh, an easy example is Heaven's Fault. Wonderful game, does a lot with really chaotic branching narratives. But by and large, the branching narrative is a dead end. It's a danger, and nobody, so nobody knows that better than the Mass Effect devs, which had these branching paths in Mass Effect 1 and 2, and then just kind of kicked them down the lane. They're like, oh, did you save somebody? Did you let them die? They'll show up in the next game. And then they do. Like, oh, you saved them, they show up, and you do stuff. Oh, did you let them die? Well, then their twin brother shows up, and they do stuff. It was a joke at how little your choices actually mattered. You could replace the ruling council of the galaxy, and it wouldn't matter at all. And if you look at tips on how to create branching narratives, you're going to find that the big advice is to not create branching narratives. You want to give the impression that you're creating a branching narrative, but you want the actual branches to be extremely cheap and merge back into the main content as quickly as possible. This is obviously not creating branching narratives, so it's the wrong term. You're creating the impression of a branching narrative. But why would you need that? Is it just to create the illusion of player agency? Well, no, it's, it's real player agency. You're actually giving the players agency. It's just that it's not narrative branching. If I choose to save someone or kill someone and then the game immediately basically forgets, that's fine. I've still chosen to save them or kill them, and maybe the game can mention it much later, not in a branching thing, but just in a reference thing. This is how most games are built these days, even classically. Like, if we look at KOTOR, KOTOR has a lot of branches that are immediately forgotten. Like, oh, did you save this planet or did you blow it up? Either way, we're never going to mention the planet again. These aren't the illusion of player agency. They're real player agency, because they are allowing the player to express their relationship to the narrative. We're the good guys. We're the bad guys. Whatever we might want to be today. It's just that the narrative isn't branching. And narrative branching is not a prerequisite, so it's okay if it doesn't. It's good if it doesn't, because branching is incredibly expensive. You, you don't want that. So what are some other methods of expressing the relationship we have with the narrative? Well, here's an easy one. How about letting the players build their own character? This is pretty obvious. Lots of RPGs do this. Uh, Dragon Age and KOTOR are obvious examples. So you get to choose. Do you want to be a human, or do you want to be a Twi'lek? Do you want to be a rogue, or a pilot, or what? what who, who are you? Oh, now it's time for you to learn lightsabery stuff. Bwow. What kind of Jedi do you want to be? Oh, did, did you want to be a Sith instead? Well, there's plenty of both types. How are you dressed? How do you fight? Who do you bring with you on your team? These are all ways that allow us to express our relationship to the narrative. The narrative is straight ahead. There are choices that you make, as I mentioned, but they don't actually affect how the narrative flows. Similarly, you don't affect how the narrative flows. But because you interact with the narrative with the understanding of who you are, you have a very different experience. Your relationship 
with the narrative is different. Are you a stalwart hero? Are you a villain? Do you get redeemed? Who did you bring with you? All of these things change how you perceive your relationship with the narrative, even though the narrative still just goes straight ahead. This is something that isn't discussed enough, in my opinion. For example, let's take this down a notch. Let's say you're playing an RPG, and you decide that you're going to customize your appearance by wearing a hat. Exciting stuff, I know. So you, in your hat, show up in all the cutscenes. Is this expressing our relationship to the narrative? Yeah, I think it is, because it changes how we think of ourselves in terms of the narrative. If we're wearing a funny top hat, then we're taking the narrative more lightly. If we wear a golden crown covered in jewels, we're obviously considering ourselves uh, as a certain kind of person within the narrative. Even if the narrative doesn't respond, the player can't help but think that their relationship to the narrative is different. It's been colored by whatever they're wearing. This can be pushed, and it's a lot of fun to discuss the kinds of pushing you can do. One example of a push would be something like The Sims. Because The Sims has no core narrative, nearly all of the narrative is formed out of the interactions of characters. There's no demons to slay, no world to save, so you don't have to relate to some overarching plot. Instead, you just relate characters to characters. And obviously, in the player's mind, how the characters are dressed is a huge factor in how those interactions are perceived. So in something like The Sims, the appearance of your character and what they're wearing is much more core to the experience than in something like, you know, Final Fantasy III. You can also push the other direction. What if our narrative... What if our relationship to the narrative is very strange? What if we don't relate to the narrative? What if the narrative is quite remote? For example, what if we're playing Saints Row 3 and 4? In Saints Row 3 and 4, you can and will dress yourself up in some of the weirdest costumes imaginable. Just for fun. And the game will faithfully put you in every cutscene dressed like a naked sex goblin, whatever it is you're dressed like and nobody will bat an eye or comment on it at all. The narrative goes out of its way to ignore what you're wearing, and it becomes this escalation where you wear ever goofier things, and the narrative continues to ignore you, and it becomes funnier and funnier and funnier. In this case, we're expressing a relationship to the narrative that is kind of distance. It's meta stuff. We're, we're pointing out that we don't really have a relationship to the narrative. We're actively denying the narrative and our relationship to it by dressing so strangely and having the narrative not respond. It's hilarious and it works great. There is a ton of thought that you can put into this, but essentially we want to know not only how the player is going to express things, but what their relationship to the narrative is going to be and what kind of narrative it is, because all of those factors will change how we do things. This is closely, re closely related to uh, something that everybody hates to talk about, I guess, ludonarrative dissonance. Now, whether or not you like or hate this term, uh, it is the same thing that we're talking about, but backwards. Ludonarrative dissonance comes from the idea that the player thinks they have a relationship to the narrative, but the narrative refuses to acknowledge that relationship. For example, I've run around this game killing literally hundreds of thousands of soldiers, and then suddenly three soldiers show up and I'm captured. The player is like, uh, you set up that I'm a badass. My relationship to the narrative is that I kill hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Why are you suddenly ignoring that? You've allowed me to express that relationship by letting me kill all these soldiers, and now suddenly I can't anymore? Are you going to explain anything? No? That's, to me, the heart of ludonarrative dissonance. It's the fact that the game sets up uh, a relationship to the narrative and then ignores that. They set it up on the game side, and then they ignore it on the narrative side, right? 
How much that affects you is obviously going to vary depending on how much you notice that kind of stuff. It's not an ethical question as to whether or not the story and the gameplay should get along, but it is something where it's worth considering if adding player agency could fix those problems. Not by creating a branching path, but by simply acknowledging that the player might have a specific kind of relationship to the narrative in mind. This is a real gold mine. Let's imagine that you have a kind of a political narrative. Your narrative involves some politics. What if the player doesn't have the same politics as you, which they almost certainly don't, because even if you're both the same demographic, you usually have some disagreements. Well, if the player character is stapled to this narrative, then that means that the player character is going to have your politics. There's really no other way around it. And that means that the player isn't really going to be able to have a meaningful relationship to the narrative because they're watching someone refuse to acknowledge the player's personal politics. But obviously, having a branching path that follows every possible person's political beliefs would be a nightmare, and it would also tell a very bad story. So, what do we do? Well, the answer is, we let the player whine. If our political story has something happen that seems like it would, you know, be politically iffy, some other group of people might judge it in a different way, we let the player say so. And then we say, ah, oh, good point, or sure, but, and then we just continue on. We twist the player's arm, and they are forced to go along with the story, but we have acknowledged the fact that they are here as outsiders. They're here under protest. Their relationship to the narrative is one of reluctance. Just the very fact that we acknowledge that they can have that relationship gives us a ton of leeway in what our narrative can actually do. Because as long as it's understood by the player that this isn't supposed to be the player's politics, we can put whatever politics we need to into the game. And I'm saying politics over and over and over, but this is really about basically anything. Let me give you an example from Final Fantasy XIV. If you're really sensitive to Final Fantasy XIV spoilers, stop here. This is early game stuff, just the first 50 levels. Um, you know, first 250 hours of the game. But it's important to understand that I recently had a really disgusting experience in Final Fantasy's uh, story, and I think that that's entirely because of player agency issues. Final Fantasy has no player agency. Not, not Final Fantasy XIV, anyway. So let me set up the storyline here. You start the game off at level one as a refugee. You roll into town on a cart, or, you know, depending on exactly what city you start in, and you're like, I'm going to be a big hero someday, and everybody's like, go for it, kid. And you're like, yay. And you get into town and they say, ah, well, we don't like refugees and we don't like adventurers. Screw you. All right. And then you're like, okay, well, what happens if I go and kill that god over there that's about to blow up the world? And they're like, oh, okay. And you're like, quack, kill the god. Everybody's like, hooray, the refugee killed the god and saved the world. Oh, no, here comes another god that's going to destroy the world. And you're like, okay, no biggie, quack. Oh no, here comes another god that's going to destroy the world. And you're like, I'll save you, don't worry. Whack! By the time you hit level 50, you have killed, and I'm not joking, seven gods and one emperor. You've saved the world at least four times. That is the relationship we have with the narrative. The game went out of its way to show that we are the only person that can save the world and that we have done it a lot of times, and that we're going to have to do it more. That's the explicit relationship that the game has given us to the narrative. So at level 50, uh, the next expansion starts, and that's when the story of refugees begins. A whole bunch of refugees sail their boat into the desert, we won't go into it, uh, and they show up at Ulda, and Ulda is like, oh well, fuck you, we hate refugees. Okay, so all of the people uh, you know who are in charge of the town, they meet up at this big table, and uh, you're over here, staring at them, 
you're wearing your glowing robes of magic and uh, uh, just coming in hot off of having saved the world again. And they're like, you know, I think I like refugees. I think I, I think we should take them in. And this guy's like, yeah, you know, refugees, they're not so bad. I think we should take them in, too. And they go around the table and six of them say, refugees, let's take them in. There's only 200 of them. Take them in. And then they all carefully stop and look across the table at the one guy they know that hates refugees. And he says, yeah, well, fuck refugees, man. They're awful. And then everybody else goes, oh, well, I guess there's nothing we can do. They'll all have to get kicked out and die. And then they all turn to you, the refugee that saved the world five times and has killed multiple gods, and you just stare at them. And they just stare at you. And you do nothing. Anyway, turns out that your friends are not as dumb as you are, and so some of them have decided that, hey, you know, we're trying to build up the Scion base. Uh, we were just talking about how we needed some people who weren't politically affiliated with any of these cities, and here come 200 new people who aren't politically affiliated, so let's just bring them in. And everybody's like, yeah, that, that works, let's just do that. Problem solved, right? Except that it turns out that the story continues. Uh, as it turns out, there are more refugees than just one boat. And they all come from different places. So when the city of Old Da says, you know, I hope those refugees all go die, all of the refugees living in and around Old Da are like, hey, um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's not cool. You're, you're being assholes and we are just trying to live our lives here. Uh, let, let's, let's do some po protesting and, and see whether or not uh, any of us can stop getting killed. And so Old Da 6 cop death squads on them, literally kills them all, and then when they start to defend themselves, you're called in. So you show up at Old Da, and you talk to the head cop guy, whose name is like Berger, Bernstein, something like that, and you're like, uh, yeah, so what's this I hear about murdering refugees? And he's like, yeah, yeah, my cops killed a whole bunch of refugees, but I promise it wasn't my fault. Anyway, then the refugees started to defend themselves. And you're like, okay, I, I see the problem now. And he's like, yeah, so I can't talk about any of this stuff because I'm way too busy. I've got to put out some more cop death squads to kill all the refugees. And as the player, I'm going, what? But of course, my player character just goes, uh-huh. And then the cop goes, so could you go kill all of the other refugees outside the city? I'll kill all the ones inside the city. And the player character is just like, uh-huh. And then you spend the next two hours hunting down and killing refugees. Now, I know that there are some people who are going to say, oh, come on, Craig, it wasn't framed like that. Maybe to you it wasn't. To me, it was super clear that me, a refugee was being asked to hunt down and kill other refugees by a cop who had gotten the refugees angry by hunting down and killing them and was putting up more cop squads to hunt down and kill them. And the game forces me to just go along with it. The funny thing is, if I had been allowed to rage at Raubon, that's his name, Raubon, if I'd been allowed to rage at Raubon, if I'd been allowed to say, hey, your cops killed these dudes. Maybe you should take responsibility for that and not kill any more dudes. That would have made me feel a lot better, even if the game had then twisted my arm and forced me to go along with this. If I was allowed to make a statement, and if I, if I was allowed to rage against the politics inherent in this thread, it would have meant a lot. It would have allowed me to go along with this thread without... Um, feeling like I was supposed to think this was the right thing to do. Yes, I am a hero that has saved the world multiple times. It is definitely the right thing to do for me to go and hunt down a bunch of refugees and kill them. Yeah. So, with all of this in mind, the next phase of this story, because it gets worse, is that it turns out that one of the people in Old Da was helping the refugees. And he's the villain. So, 
cop death squad guy over here covered in scars and full of cops. He's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, so after my dudes killed all of those refugees, I promise it wasn't my fault. Wink, wink. After my dudes killed all those refugees, and then I sent out more dudes to kill out the refugees and told the hero of the world to go kill some refugees, uh, it turns out that the problem is this one guy who is trying to help them. And he literally says that this guy is going to build orphanages because he's evil. Now, the idea is that he's building orphanages in an area where they would be politically expedient or something and that they might be in danger and stuff like that. And it's like more danger than just being hunted down by death squads. It turns out that this evil merchant who's who's helping these refugees is doing so because he wants to dig up an ancient broken thing from some ruins somewhere and for some reason helping the refugees allows him to and he's gonna fix it and then use it to conquer the world the fuck are you talking about listen Raoban I know you you are the cop guy who murders refugees do you have any evidence that this guy is going to try and conquer the world with a broken toy? At all? Or are you just here because you want to kill more refugees? But of course, the game doesn't allow me to say those things or anything even vaguely like those things. I am forced to move forward with the idea that Rao Bon, proven refugee killer, is the good guy and the merchant proven trying to help the refugees is the bad guy and of course it's written such that that's correct but it's it's one of those situations where if the story was exactly the same but i was allowed to complain about it it would be much easier to go along with it it would be much more palatable and i would be allowed to understand that the politics of the devs aren't literally that all refugees should be killed because that's kind of what it sounds like your politics are at the moment guys <laughs> and yeah you can claim oh man craig took that the wrong way that's not how that story was supposed to be taken at all but that's that's the whole point player agency allows me to express my relationship to the narrative and my relationship is not going to be the same as someone else's relationship that's literally the point so if you add in the ability for the player to express their relationship to the narrative, you allow the player to relate themselves to the narrative. And that means that players who would normally be driven away or disinterested can be pulled in and, you know, have a relationship that's a little bit more cautious or one way. And the game can accept that. And you can still tell your story and everybody can still have fun. But if your game involves forcing the player to hunt down and kill refugees, it's going to catch some backlash from me because you're trash. The idea that FF14 somehow turns into a game worth playing after the 250 hour mark seems increasingly unlikely. I am far more likely to believe that all of the players, all 300 million players, are delusional because they apparently were okay with this plot line where you have to hunt down and kill refugees as a refugee on behalf of the police. <sighs> Bye.